I was in an abusive marriage for 20 years uh, and my husband never hit me. Um, he, when I met him, he was a, a new believer who was on fire. He memorized scripture like crazy. He, we, when we were first married, we actually led a newly married class for you newly led a new married <laughs> class. Wow. Yeah. I look back at that and go, how did that happen? I don't know because the abuse really began before we were married. Hello, my name is Gretchen Baskerville, and I'm the author of The Life-Saving Divorce, Hope for People Leaving Destructive Relationship. I've been a divorce recovery leader in churches throughout Los Angeles area for more than 20 years. Today, I am interviewing Cindy Burrell. She's a blogger, author, and a divorce coach. She's written the book, Why Is He So Mean to Me?, and a new book, reformulating the Christian marriage counseling model where abuse is involved. Uh, her website is hurtbylove.com, hurt, H-U-R-T-B-Y-L-O-V-E.com. Anyway, welcome, Cindy. Uh, I'm so happy to have you. Thank you for having me today. Tell us about yourself and then jump right in and tell us uh, your your divorce story, your marriage and divorce story, because you're an abuse survivor. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to share. Um, I was in an abusive marriage for 20 years uh, and my husband never hit me. Um, he, when I met him, he was a, a new believer who was on fire. He memorized scripture like crazy. He, we, when we were first married, we actually led a newly married class for you newly led a new married <laughs> class. Wow. Yeah. I look back at that and go, how did that happen? I don't know because the abuse really began before we were married. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of what I saw was um, a very, he was very quite controlling and manipulative. Um, he told me who I should be friends with, who I shouldn't be friends with. Um, dictated how we spent our time, everything. Uh, looking back, I can see that everything we did revolved around what he wanted and what he needed. And of course, when you're dating, matter. you just sort of go, oh, you want to go out for Japanese food? Okay, fine, you know, and kind of go along with the plan. But anything that I needed was secondary or unimportant. And so I was absolutely relegated to the back seat mm. in yeah. everything. Um, and he was very manipulative. He would, he was a liar. He was an addict. He was a porn addict. He ended up becoming addicted to prescription drugs and alcohol. And of course that just fuels um, moodiness and a lot of hostility and anger. So, you know, we had all the marks of an abusive relationship. Um, and it wasn't until I got out actually, that's the sad part. I think it's important to say that no one, even when I shared what was going on in my marriage with other Christians and, and I, even a couple counselors, no one ever used the word abuse. Mm. It's no stunning. one, not one of the counselors you saw mm -mm. ever saw mm -hmm. that behavior, that controlling behavior, that manipulative behavior and ever called it abuse. Nope. And when we met with a pastor, it was, you know, we, at one point it was, you know, marital difficulties, you're having conflict and, but it was always, what do we need to do to fix it? And yeah. so, you know, you stay. And so 20 years later, I was a basket case. I was a mess. I was exhausted and just emotionally beaten up and dried up. I had, I was like, Lord, I, I can't do this anymore. He's the one who set me free. And I felt looking back, I look at, I, I felt like there were so many times I felt like the spirit was literally saying, this is insane. Mm. That was the word I heard. This is insane. The, the Lord is telling you, this is this, insane. You can't live like this any longer. Yes. And I, and I went and I, I ignored that voice for years, just for mm. years. It was like, but, you know, there's the, but, but I can do this or one more day, just one more day. It has to get better. Um, and obviously it didn't. So um, I didn't see it till I got out. And then I started reading my old journals. I kept journals for years. And you start, all of a sudden, I'm reading my old journals and I could see the patterns. 
And it was so consistent and so absurd and so cruel. And to stay in that for so long was, was, had nothing to do with God. There was nothing godly about it. it was nothing Did you find God. yourself, as you looked back, um, making lists of, of ways you could be a better wife, you know, uh, reading more books, turning yourself inside out, being more agreeable, being more sexually available, those kinds of things? All of it. You know, it was up to, it's, and I know all victims relate to this. It's up to you. Right. You have to fix it. You can be better. You have to be more forgiving and loving and gentle and kind and patient and all of those things. And you believe that there's a reward at the end of that, that he's going to go, oh, I don't understand. I don't know why I didn't see it. You're amazing. And he's going to change. And there's going to be this wonderful honeymoon and, and God will be glorified. Right. right. And um, it's a tragic fallacy to think that we, have the power to change anyone. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and yet we hear this over yeah. and over from marriage at any cost organizations, those organizations that want you to keep trying, even in the face of serial adultery, dangerous uh, physical abuse, chronic emotional abuse that's driving you to despair and depression and suicidal ideation. And yet these marriage at any cost organizations you know, wave this carrot. If you just did it right, you know, you could single-handedly turn this marriage around. If you just set a good enough example, um, your, your positive attitude will fix this marriage. And, and people like you and people like me have our walking testimonies to the fact that you can do that all day long. You can, you can try for thousands of days um, you know, a 20 year marriage is over 7,000 days. How many more times do you have to try uh, before you realize that um, God's been calling him, the Holy Spirit's been convicting him of sin and righteousness. You've been doing your part and this guy's just resistant to changing. He doesn't want to change. Right. And one of my, one of the things that I, I really struggle with is when people say, well, hurting people hurt people. Ah, uh, oh, uh, now. <laughs> Unpack that for us. Yes, because it's like the reality is we've all been hurt. We've all been wounded deeply in some way at some point in our lives and maybe in multiple ways, but we don't all become abusers. Right. In fact, some of us, it's like we've been wounded. We become more tenderhearted and more compassionate because of what we've been through. How can it be that this Christian person can be an abuser? It's, it's hypocrisy. Yeah. When you know the Lord, when he comes in and changes you, then you don't, abuse is not a spiritual gift. <laughs> right, right. And like First Peter 3 says, uh, husbands are supposed to be understanding and respectful treatment to their wives. Yes. Yes. And, you know, the Bible is really clear about how uh, men are to treat their wives and vice versa. Yes. Um, and so why is it that this is our fault. <laughs> you know, Jesus, right. I keep telling people, you know, Jesus didn't, um, didn't convert everyone who ran across. There are people who said, yeah, G Jesus, thanks, but no thanks. And they walked away from him, the rich young ruler, Judas. Jesus yeah. didn't go running after them and uh, say, well, I'll just set a better example. I'll be nicer. And maybe you'll, you'll, you'll follow me. No, Jesus just let them go. Right. And, um, you know, I think that it's, it's something we, we just need to accept. So, so go on, you've, you know, you've realized you're, you're exhausted at year 20. You realize you can't go on any, any longer. The Holy Spirit has told you, this is insane. Now what happens? Um, well, if I finally cut the cord, I finally knew that it was time to go. And honestly, it was one of the most difficult painful seasons because there was just so much turmoil and there was so there was no um I had no idea what was going to happen to me and my kids were we going to have to move were we going to lose our house was I going to be broke you know all of those things and it was so it went from being hard to being harder mm. in many yeah. ways logistically and I had no plan I had no idea but I had the Lord and it was amazing to sense his validation and his constant presence. And it was like, I've already made a way for you. 
Um, I told God people already made a path. Yes, I remember a, a point where I told the Lord, I said, um, I know there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And the spirit said to me, there is a light, not only at the end of the tunnel, but in it. Oh, the, there is a light in the, in the darkness, in the, in the pain, in the suffering. Uh, and even though you've gone from bad to even worse, mm -hmm. this isn't the end of the story. Mm -mm. And it was like, I'm with you right here, right now, and I'm going to get you to the other side. Mm -hmm. And boy, I clung to that. And it was not an easy journey. And, but, and then, and, and just being able to walk in that, it was a daily thing, literally. And I tell women this because it's like, well, I need to know how it's all going to work out. No, if this is a true walk of faith to get one step one day at a time and watch and see how God provides. Yeah. And I have, I, I tell you, people, I, I, they ask me, how can you do divorce recovery for 20 years? Doesn't that just destroy you? I said, no, I get a front row seat in watching the Holy Spirit put people back together again. Mm -hmm. And to see that hope and that faith come back into their eyes mm -hmm. and for them to say, you know, you told me there was life on the other side of divorce, and now I know it's true. And not from you, not because you said it, but because the Lord revealed it to me. So go on. I love what you're saying. But isn't it, I mean, it really is the most powerful thing because you're in so much pain on the one hand and you're recovering and you're grieving and you have no idea where the Lord's going to lead you. And then yet to day by day, watch him do it. Um, it was a miraculous journey. And, um, and then of course I, you know, a few years in, I was going to counseling every other week. I found an amazing counselor and I saw him every other week and it helped that it was a man too, because mm. I did not trust man. I walked in and sat down in front of him and I said, he said, what can I do for you? And I said, I've decided that all men are scum. Mm, wow. <laughs> How did he react to that? <laughs> he literally, he burst out laughing. He was just like that. And he goes, well, I know where I stand. Let's get started. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, he, it was really neat to be able to, to have him validate where I'd been and for him to show me. And then I had other men in my life who were setting an amazing example that not all men are scum that, and then it was, and I remember, um, at one point, my, one of my girlfriends said, what about your sons? Cause mm -hmm. I have two sons sure. and I went, Oh my gosh, it can't be true. Because I would never assume that my my sons were destined to be horrible men, and so it was like, okay, I need to I need to figure this out. And our Lord is a male, <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know. So it's like, okay, now I need to unpeel it, you know, to 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 work through, to get down to the truth of who God is, and what He wants for us. And so for like two years, every other week, I was going for counseling and. The Lord just brought, brought great healing, deep heart healing. And, um, and then I started dating again and uh, met my husband. Um, after I was done, I'd done some online dating and went, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I don't even dating. care anymore. Oh, right there. <laughs> yeah, I'm done. And then my husband, my, the man to whom I married appeared magically. And um, he was living 400 miles away. He moved 400 miles to left his job and transferred to date me. And uh, eight months to the day that we met, we were married. Oh, wow. And we were married. We've been married for 15 years. And he's the love of my life. And, oh, yeah. this is such a wonderful, super story. He's the love of your life. I, oh. I, I, I too, uh, I too remarried after 20 years of being single. Um, I, I married a wonderful wow. man who, exactly. you know, <laughs> A man who knew good and well that I would spend all day long talking about divorce recovery and and helping um, women and men get out of abusive marriages, and uh, he, I said, you realize I'm feisty. You realize I'm really opinionated. You realize I'm, I'm, I'm taking a very um, uh, debated stance in the Christian world. And he says, I love you. 
I love you exactly as you are. Go for it. And he, so uh, I, you know, let's, let's put out a, a, a shout out for these wonderful men yes. who love us exactly as we are. And uh, my husband was also willing to move a hundred miles to where I was. And so there are great men out there. Yes. Uh, I realize our, our, our uh, lives are colored a little bit by negative experiences, but these kinds of really destructive men are really only about make up, um, you know, less than maybe one in eight, or uh, about one in eight in, in American culture. And, you know, we can learn to avoid them. And in fact, I, if you have time, I'd love to hear uh, you talk about how you learn to avoid the you know, the abusers and the cheaters? Eh. <laughs> you know, I feel like initially we have to learn to trust our instincts. And I that's hard. Like it's hard. We don't, we've been taught not to trust our instincts. Mm -hmm. So that was a really big hurdle for me. Um, and I would, and, and having been so deprived emotionally and neglected and, you know, abandoned basically to then even have a guy show interest was in some ways such a temptation. It's like, he likes me. Oh my gosh, somebody is interested in me. And um, I would be too quick to assume the best mm -hmm. rather than testing the water and going really slow and waiting to see if this person was safe. I just open myself up and all of a sudden I go, I don't even like this person. And now I don't even know how to gracefully get away from them. And we're so used to being kind and gentle and accommodating that even that is difficult to say, oh yeah, I've decided I'm not interested. Boom, goodbye. Yeah. We now, did, did you meet your husband online? I did. Okay. And I, I was- I know he was different. Or <laughs> what, did, what kinds of questions and what were you looking for? I mean, we always have our guard up, you know, mm -hmm. doing online dating. Mm -hmm. But what were kind of the the ways the walls fell? I will. I I was. I had a two week window between before my my account lapsed, and I was just waiting for it to expire. I was done. He so and he had just come on, so we had literally a two win two week window in which to meet, and. Um, you know, a lot of guys, when you go and you look at their, their profile, there's a lot of ego, there's a lot of bravado, I do this for a living, and I live here, and I have this beautiful home, and or whatever the issues are. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it has to go deeper. And so um, I had read enough of those puffy profiles, I will call them. And um, suddenly, I get this wink in my inbox, and I'm like, ah. Oh, crud you know <laughs> i'm almost done yeah no. not another one i didn't don't want to do this again and i and i opened up this page and here's this ginormous man straddling a harley davidson with these this these arms covered with tattoos and he's muscular and hairy and he's and he's got these big old glasses on the big old mustache and a, his motorcycle helmet on i could hardly see him but i literally jumped in my seat and jumped and i thought he could squash me like a bug. That was my first thought about my husband. And, um, but, I, but then I re started reading his profile, no bravado, no ego. It was, here's who, this is who I am. This is what I believe in. This is what matters to me. This oh, wow. is what I'd like to see in a relationship. And I was like, if that goes with that, I need to know, I need more information. And okay, so your initial response, your initial impression is not my guy, not my guy. I was terrified. <laughs> and then you, you read and you thought, okay, I'm going to give him a chance. Mm -hmm. You weren't sold. Mm -hmm. You were a skeptic. Mm -hmm. So then what? Then he was just so raw and real. And so I replied back to him and we just started conversing. And uh, my computer was really old and it kept dying in the middle of our online conversations. And so I thought, oh great, he thinks I just cut him off <laughs> because my computer died. And so I said, maybe we should talk by phone. So we got on the phone and again, there was no, 
I'm, I'm Mr. Wonderful. It was just, he was very open and real about where he had been, who he was, what he believed in. He didn't want to play games. There was no, there was no showboating. And it just wasn't, it was probably within two weeks. We hadn't even met yet. And I was pretty sure. Wow. Isn't that something now you no doubt if, well, may, I, I should ask you rather than assuming, but most of us Christian women with children say, mm -hmm. I've got too much baggage. No good man is going to want me. Tell me a little bit about you and him and your, and your four children. That's a great question because you're right. That's a huge issue. And um, when I told Doug that I had four kids and he asked me to describe them and I did in accurate detail. And wow. I had one that was what my eldest son was uh, kind of a spitfire and he was kind of the looking for a fight. He sort of emulated his father in a lot of ways and we had to have work through that. But um, I remember telling Doug about him and I said, look, I get it. You know, one broken woman, four broken children. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, I don't see it that way. He said, I see four other lives that I can bless. Oh my gosh, I wanna cry right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. What a, what a giver. Yes. Instead of what's in it for me, the guy's a giver. This is, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm no, gonna, you're so sweet. Please. In fact, I had, I had met another man uh, probably months earlier and I told him, I met him at a New Year's Eve party, in fact, and he wanted to dance with me. And so we were dancing and I said, he said, you have kids? And I said, yeah, I have four. And he was like, nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, okay, fine. You know, I'm a package. I was like, you know, it's a package yeah. deal. So if the package doesn't work, you know, you have to weigh those things. But he really, he really took on a huge a huge load and he's loved all of us. And the, I will tell you um, that my kids have not seen their own father in 10 years. Oh, wow. uh, and a couple of them have talked to him, but he's still toxic and they call Doug dad. Oh, do they really? Wow. That's lovely. Yeah. That's so intimate and such a big, a, such a big decision for um, a kid to make. Uh, for themselves, you know, um, and it happened a couple of years ago. Just I, they apparently all decided because one day all four of them just started calling him dad. And he wow. he loves it. It means a lot to him. He knows. You know, last Christmas, my daughter, uh, who does have a relationship with her, you know, her real dad, uh, asked me if she could call my new husband. We've only been married about four and a half years. If she could call him um, a dad or you know, stepdad. And I said, I think he'd really be honored. And so she did. She wrote him a Christmas card and called him dad. And um, he was really touched. I mean, he knew what that, what that meant. Um, and so uh that when when a child chooses to do that themselves that is really an amazing thing yes. so anyway um wow let me ask you i want to go back to something else because we've been talking about our faith and we've been talking about abuse and you mentioned i i got out to save my sanity i didn't even realize i was abused until I looked back in my journals. Um, and I want you to talk a little bit about why it's so hard for people of faith to recognize they're being abused. And then um, at the end of our time, I'd like you to talk about why counselors and therapists can't identify abuse in many cases. So let's start with the individuals themselves. Why is it so hard for them to recognize they're being abused? And uh, give us some examples. I think a lot of it initially is mi the mixed messages that we get. Because if, I don't know about you, but for me, my abuser could tell me he loved me every single day. And he mm. did. He told me in words that he loved me, even though his actions were absolutely the opposite. Wow. And, and so... I and, and wait, let me stop you for a second. Yeah. So many organizations, these marriage at any cost organizations say, 
you know, your marriage will be great if you just tell your wife you love her every day or kiss her every day. And yet person after person, now my husband didn't tell me, my first husband didn't tell me he loved me on a regular basis, but boy, have I heard a lot of stories from women who said he told me daily he loved me and even kissed me on the lips oh, yeah. um, and yet was either cheating or all kinds of crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. So talk to us more about that. That had to be incredibly confusing for you. Exactly. It is confusing because you hear the words and you assume that that's the truth. So you, you take this, you assume, well, it doesn't feel like love over here, but he says he loves me. Mm -hmm. And you choose to believe the words rather than the actions. It's a, it's a very weak spot, I think, in our lives and our hearts. And I think so much of it really comes back to our faith. Um, okay. He says he's a Christian. Yep. He's memorized scripture. He goes to church. He might lead a Bible study. Um, the worst abuser I ever um, dealt with or his wife, he was a missionary. Mm. The man was so incredibly toxic and controlling. And God told me to tell you this. And God told me you need to do, you need to not have relationships with your family because they're, Dan, they're interfering in our marriage and things like that. And you go, you, we trust them. We trust the words, we trust the image rather than our heart and what's really going on. The, the wounds that are being inflicted on a daily basis, we stuff them down, we pretend they're not there, we have figure out, we figure it must be me. I'm too, and they'll tell you, you're, too, you're needy, mm -hmm. you're demanding, you're selfish. Um, you're, you're so now, critical. Yes, you're... Um, you know, you don't do enough for me, or your expectations are too high. And it all comes down to this pressure from them. And they're, to tr they're training us to doubt our reality. Yeah. So we don't have permission to say, I am hurting so deeply. I am so wounded, but I'm also embarrassed by it. I'm ashamed of it because I'm afraid that I'm the problem. Yeah. What happens if I find out I really am the problem? I'm this, and they'll tell you, you're the source of everything that's wrong in our relationship. Yeah. And then I would tell my friends, you know, you just kind of, I used to kind of just crack open a window, and let a little bit out, share a little bit. And without fail, I would get, well, you know, you just really need to be praying for him. Mm -hmm. maybe he's going through a hard time yeah um, you just Be need to loving. love yes love unconditionally forgive 70 times seven and on it goes and we're saddled with this load of expectation of what we're supposed to do to figure it out mm -hmm. it's a it's a heavy load a heavy pressure and, you know, you tell people that they're not going to, they don't go, well, that sounds like an abusive marriage to me. And maybe you should just get out of it. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't have given to, to hear those words. You don't. Yeah. They, do, you know, uh, in our Christian world, very few people are willing to call a spade a spade and say, that's controlling. You're in a marriage where only his or in the case of men who are married to abusers, only her uh, feelings, wants and desires and preferences matter and yours don't matter at all. And yet so few Christian counselors are willing to call balls and strikes yes. and say, this, this doesn't, it sounds like you're being controlling, controlled. It sounds like you're being pressured. It sounds like his expectations of you are not normal. A normal marriage isn't like this. And I thank God for every good Christian counselor who points those things out. Maybe they don't use the word abuse because that's too frightening to the average Christian, but to talk about pressure and control and, you know, this doesn't seem loving. This doesn't seem understanding or respectful to you. Um, and and I, I just um, am so appreciative of those who who step forward and take a chance and, and uh tell a, a, a young abused spouse or even older abused spouses yes. um, what's really going on. So and lead and let them 
let them find the truth. Because I think what we what it too often happens is we keep them away from the truth. Mm-hmm. We veer them away from it and back to the responsibility on them. Why shouldn't we as believers be allowed to use the word abuse? That's even that is like, why can't they say it out loud? Right. You are in an abusive marriage. Everything you just described to me is abusive. Yeah. Man, those are life-changing words. And and uh, where whatever happened to you know a tree by its fruit. Exactly. Where's yeah. the fruit? What kind of fruit are you seeing? Are you seeing healthy fruit or damaging tr- fruit? You know, harmful effects on your relationship. It really right. shouldn't be. It's it's tragic to me that it's so hard to find people who will use the word abuse and say it out loud or say, what do, what do you think this is? And let them come to their conclusion say, I'm dying inside. Yeah. I'm it also irks me to no end. The um, I, I interviewed a lot of people before writing my book, The Life-Saving Divorce, because um, my husband, my new husband, uh, uh, has a background in journalism. And he said, you need to interview people from all walks of life, all races, all parts of the country, all different kinds of denominational backgrounds. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the things I found were all these people who were told that um, they needed to sacrifice themselves because holiness was better than happiness in their marriage. And it just struck me that when you've got a person in the marriage who's defiling it, when you've got a person in the marriage who's being mean or who's betraying, then your marriage is not holy. Uh, it's every day they're in your life and in the children's life, it's becoming less holy, less healthy, less godly, less um, God honoring, um, uh, less sane, mm-hmm. um, less honest. Right. Um, uh, there's less integrity in that home. Right. And by divorcing and becoming a single parent and raising my kids myself, I, I was, uh, I had, because of my husband's illegal and immoral behavior, I got sole custody. But I realized that holiness was being achieved in my family now, because the, the person who was defiling and debauching our, our marriage in our home uh, was gone. Now our home was God honoring, Mm -hmm. integrity honoring, kindness honoring, Mm -hmm. truth honoring, responsibility honoring. Mm -hmm. Our home was becoming holier um, because of of the divorce. And I had never really thought about it that way, but but that's the truth of it. So let's jump into the bit about what you wish therapists knew because you wrote an entire book on this on how (laughs) therapists um i mean i i read your book and i was like blown away because you're if i understand correctly you're not a licensed therapist and yet you know you were teaching them about abuse tactics that are so subtle that a lot of therapists miss them you were teaching them about why victims may not realize they're being uh, abused. You were teaching them about how abuse can occur right there in the office, right in the counseling environment. Um, You were were teaching them about the dangerous assumptions that they make. Um, You were teaching them how to to, um, see counterfeits versus true repentance Mm -hmm. and when reconciliation is really safe. And I have to say, I've been in, you know, church ministry, uh, in divorce recovery in churches for 20 years. Even I get conned every once in a while. Even I get tricked by someone in a divorce recovery group. So help us teach us what you were teaching in that book. Oh, wow. That's a load of question. Um, yeah, because that literally took me years. That's been years in the making, that book. And it's really grounded in, um, like you're saying, my conversations with so many people, with women and their stories, or they would write to me in their emails, and I've just banked it, you know, and you, and you begin to see all these terribly, ridiculously unhealthy patterns in the counseling environment. Um, and it all, be- first of all, well, it begins with a singular pre- premise, 
And that is that the priority is always to save the marriage. Mm. No when, matter how destructive, yes. they're, you have a dangerous therapist uh, if their priority is to save your marriage. Yes. Which sounds so counterintuitive, doesn't it, though? I yeah. mean, it sounds like, well, that's a God, that's an honorable thing is to save the marriage. Well, not if it's so backwards because the priority is always, in my book, truth. Because Jesus said, when you know, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Not a list, not a to-do list. It's truth. So we always have to come back to what is true about the relationship. Not what do I want or right. what am I going to try to manipulate or, or formulate um, based on certain strategies, but what is really true about not only the, the, the relationship and the individuals in it. Right. Because you can have a really healthy, godly, caring, loving person on the one hand, and on the other, someone who is toxic and, and selfish and cruel and say, well, if we can figure out a way to make these, this thing work, we'll be good with that. No, because you can't. And you and I both know that because you're talking about the benefits of a healthy home and, a, and healthy children and watching them blossom and grow and seeing balance and love and respect and all those things. When we try to keep that toxic relationship together, we are setting a, an example. Yeah. And we're establishing and promoting patterns that if we don't break the cycle, our kids will take those same attributes into their future relationships. Yes. So, so important to say that we've got to be the ones who break the cycle. We've got to be the ones who say the defiling and the destruction and the, uh, uh, of our marriage and, and the whole toxicity of the home ends with me. Right. Uh, and and I think another thing these counselors don't realize is that researchers have known for 30 years that these highly toxic, often called high conflict or high discord or um, homes that may not even be violent. They may just be full of betrayal and and substance abuse and other things mm -hmm. that these are terrible for kids mm -hmm. and that kids um, actually do 10 times better when you divorce mm -hmm. to escape these particularly bad marriages. And these are often the, the marriages that uh, conservative people of faith find themselves in yes. because we have a tendency to stay longer right. and to uh, blame it on ourselves and just absorb uh, the ab abuse or reframe it in a more charitable way. Mm -hmm. So oh, finding the truth so and calling it for what it is, uh, which is what you're talking about, is really important. Well, and, and I think it um, in that relationship, you have a predator and you have prey. And so when we're when not only with us, but with our kids, they have to choose which side they're going to be on in their, own, not only in the home, but in their own life. Are they going to be a predator? Are they going to choose to, to put themselves at the top of the food chain? Or are they going to be prey like the mom or the abuse victim and try to just make peace and try to make things better and try to survive in this terribly toxic environment? Instead, we need to teach our kids, no, I'm going to be a protector. Mm, I they're, like that. They're, not prey, not predator, but the protector. Good. Yes. So okay. this is where I feel like, you know, the, the noble, seemingly noble cause of keeping your marriage together. There's no such thing if it's abusive. It's, it's toxic. It's unhealthy. And we're, we're, we're setting a standard and we're calling it a Christian home. Yeah. How is that holy? How is that? Oh. How is an abusive Christian home in any way a holy marriage? I mean, God's not mocked. That's that's right. not holy. That's destructive. Right. Right. And years of research are showing us that when you've got a kid, uh, when your children are living 24 seven with a person who has no remorse, who has this reckless disregard for safety, who gets in a lot of fights, who's constantly irritable, who um, uh, is deceptive and and uh, loves to brag about their deception over and trickery over others. You've got you've you're actually setting your children up to develop conduct be, uh, disorders, behavior disorders themselves. Right. So 
we we are obligated in some way mm -hmm. to rescue our children from these really destructive situations. Absolutely. And the other thing I think that I, we don't talk enough about, and I don't know how you have dealt with it, but regret. Mm. I have lived with the burden of regret, and it's been a very hard journey for the Lord to actually get me to the other side of that, to fully release that into his hands. Because when I look back and I see what my kids endured and that I was right there and I did, and I failed to protect them and I failed to get them out when I should have done so, so many years earlier, that burden of regret is huge. And I'm just to whoever's listening, you don't want that. Right. <laughs> right. You don't need that in your life. Right. Do it, you know, do what you need to do to protect yourself and your kids, you know, before God and let and and reclaim what's been lost and stand up for what you know is right and true and healthy for your kids and yourself. Yeah, so standing up that honors God. It's standing up for what you know is healthy and true. And and when women come to me and, and they um, have you know, regrets or men too. Like I said, my group is for both uh, uh, abused wives and abused husbands. Um, you know, I, I tell them that the journey to, to health, to, to healing your children starts with the very first day you walk out of there. So by just by leaving, you are setting them a whole new trajectory. And second, we really can't blame ourselves. Um, I don't know about how, how long you've been uh, a person of faith or, uh, but I mean, I've been going to church since the week I was born. I mean, I have heard nothing uh, but from, from, the, from infancy about uh, how it was my responsibility to make the marriage good and that I was the one who had to be agreeable and I was the one who had to, to uh, fix it. And that, um, you know, it was uh, all marriage problems were 50-50 and, um, you know, it takes two to tango and, you know, you can't claim to be innocent because... You know, if you're pointing your finger at them, there's four, you know, fingers pointing at you. And so yeah. we should let, we can have regrets, but we need to also be a realistic that we were taught from the yes. day we were born that it was our fault. Mm -hmm. And the church is going to have a mighty reckoning with those uh, well-meaning bits of advice that are absolutely devastating to abuse victims. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those kinds of little sayings might be helpful for young, immature people, but um, they assume that all the couple needs is a little, you know, a good class in marriage communication and problem solving, and everything will be fine because obviously two Christians must have the best interest of each other at heart. But with abuse, one person doesn't have the best interest of the other right. and the other is sacrificing themselves over and over and over yep. for the wishes desires and emotions of the abuser yes. but they're not getting anything back so i don't think we can have too many regrets or if we do regret let's just be really honest let's not give ourselves more than 10 percent of the blame because we were bombarded with messages from the day we were born yes. absolutely bombarded yes. so Let's get rid of that regret. Um, and, and I know it's easier for me to say than it is to do, but I'm so glad you brought that up. Very well. Okay, tell us about your books. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, my first book was Why Is He So Mean to Me? And that is a book that arose out of my journals. Okay. Um, when I was able to finally see all the strategies and the, the games, the mindset, and it just it just came to life. It was so obvious to me. Um, and, and that was what I was always asking myself. Why is he so mean to me? What, what did I do to deserve this? And uh, so I, I actually tried to find a Christian publisher, went through some agents and that nobody would, I think I got one rejection letter and no one else even acknowledged. <laughs> and so I told Doug, I said, well, I guess I'm done with that. And he goes, no, you're not. We're going to self-publish it. And we're going to start a website and you, we're going to, we're going to do this. And I Amen. Said, let's, okay, hear it. let's do it. And so that's where Hurt My Love got started. And then I started posting articles on there. I have almost probably close to a hundred different articles 
on various aspects of the abuse dynamic, depending on what people are looking for. Um, you know, financial abuse, spiritual abuse, um, you know, sexual abuse, all kinds of things that are in there, articles are in there. Um, and a lot of the, the different strategies that abusers use. Um, my other, another book after that was um, uh, God is My Witness, Making a Case for Biblical Divorce. And that was what I wrote after the Lord began showing me, because I said, Lord, if, if I'm sinning, because people basically told me that I was wrong to divorce my husband, I was mm -hmm. told that I failed. And that if I really had enough faith, God would have saved our marriage. And um, so I got, a, I got a lot of guilt trips from people. Um, and so I went searching for the truth and I said, Lord, show me what your heart is for marriage and divorce. And, and if, if I'm sinning, then why did I, why do I feel free? Why am I free? When I know you release me, I know you validated me. I know you walk with me through this whole thing. How does that line up with scripture? And so he started bringing me truth and yeah. opening my eyes to the truth about God's heart for marriage and the provision of divorce, as you well know, uh, right. for cause when, you know, people are, if you're not loving, honoring, and cherishing your spouse as you vow to, you've broken your vows, you've broken the marriage covenant, but nobody talks about those things. They'll just say, well, God hates divorce. And so if you're divorced, you're a second or third class Christian on the totem pole of faith. And um, the Lord just completely open my eyes to that. And that became that book. Um, and my newest book, uh, Reformulating the Christian Marriage Counseling Model, where abuse is involved. Again, that was a result of so many of the stories that I received. Um, and I've learned or, and heard over the years and chronicled um, about their own experiences. And I just, just left me shaking my head going, I, I can't believe these things happen in a pastor's office or a counseling office. The way abuse victims are treated and relegated to the back seat and guilted and shamed and, and coerced into staying in these toxic relationships and how they always, they, they always in, incorporate couples counseling. And I'll tell you from the get go, if I never say anything else, never, ever, ever do couples counseling with an abuser. Right. Right. Don't, don't even try it because they, you have three people in the room, they know how to triangulate it. And all of a sudden there's the victim and she's being tag teamed by the abuser and the counselor. And they're, yeah. they're dogpiling on the victim. And it's stunning. The, the stories are just horrific. And then they have to, they're going it alone. Again, they're, they're exhausted. They're they're feeling so downtrodden and unworthy and like a terrible Christian. And now they've got the system piling up on all this guilt and shame on them. And um, so I do, I really dissect the dynamic, the, the common Christian marriage counseling model. I kind of take it apart, look at it the way it typically functions. And then I identify why it fails when there's abuse in the picture. And then I present a brand new model and say, this is what Christian marriage counseling should look like if there's any indications of abuse and what you can expect if he says he's repentant test it test the premise all of that needs to be um i just i'm shocked at how weak the present system is yeah on the whole and i don't yeah. know how I you would think that uh, you know, when uh, places like the Gottman uh, Institute say that half the people who come into counseling, you should just assume that there has been actual real violence, actual physical violence. Wow. Um, and, you know, they would be coming to you unless they were in a, in a world of hurt. And, and yet our, our counselors so often just treat it as a marriage communication problem or problem solving problem or a negotiating problem. And granted if if the per, if the couple is young and immature and they don't have any very little life experience and they've never been in the workforce and they've never had to answer right. to a boss or try to weave their way through a, a a dicey customer service issue yeah those kinds of things really probably will help mm -hmm. but you know that's not the solution for every marriage 
problem. And a lot of marriage problems are way over that. And it is completely unethical, as you've already uh, you know, referred to, for uh, a, a therapist to do couples counseling, uh, marriage counseling with the two people in the room with the therapist, completely unethical for exactly the reasons you said, because what happens is the, the abuser is usually a very charming person and they're able to triangulate that therapist onto their side. And the next thing you know, as you mentioned, uh, the victim's being beaten up right there in the office mm -hmm. and feeling more uh, discouraged. And, um, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's shocking. I mean, uh, my, the, the man who did our premarital counseling with my first marriage, he actually knew what the felony level issues were in our marriage, in our, in our relationship were. Wow. And even though he was studying for his PhD in psychology and had access to the DSM, he never called it out for what it was, what it, what it was admitted to be. Wow. And he never said, you need to know that this is very dangerous, very destructive behavior, and that it's, we already know from decades, if not centuries of studying this, that this is not going to go away. Wow. This will not go away. Uh, instead, he apologized me to me a year after the wedding. And, but what could I do as a oh. devout, committed Christian? I was, I was in my marriage for life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is what well-meaning but naive and overly enthusiastic, overly optimistic, Pollyanna-ish therapists do to innocent, loving, hope-filled yes. young Christians. Shame on them. Mm -hmm. Shame on them. It's just wrong. Yeah. Uh, and I'm so glad you wrote your book. Now, I want to ask you, how can people find you? Oh, um, yeah, my, uh, the website is hurtbylove.com and the books can be found there. The link to the personal coaching information is there. All the articles are there. Um, and my email is Cindy Burrell at hurtbylove.com. So people are welcome to email me and I'll, and, <clears throat> excuse me, ask if they have questions or whatever, or looking for articles on certain issues, I'd be happy to refer them, um, and make some suggestions. Um, uh, I thought of something else I wanted to say. Oh, Real quick, I just wanted to get back to the counseling thing, though, too, something that you, you triggered. And I and I want to just say this only because I know it's so common, because when I went into counseling, one of the first questions they said asked was, is he hitting you? Uh -huh. <laughs> and if you say no, then out comes that, well, then you just need to. All right. Right. So well, I just then. think that's you really important. Too. Yes, because that's that's such a common misperception. And I can and I remember being in that situation. They say, "Well, is he hitting you?" And I said, "No." And I just felt like, oh. yeah. if only he was hitting me, yes, I might have a leg to stand on. But yes, yes. And and can I say something? I want to, on behalf of all infidelity survivors, I want to apologize to all you emotional abuse survivors. Because when I started my first group uh, with a co-leader, both of us were infidelity survivors. Mm. Back in 1998, we started our first wow. group. And we didn't know what to do with emotional abuse survivors until we heard them say exactly what you just said. If he had just hit me, or it, I prayed every day that he would just cheat on me. Aww. And my, my co-leader and I are going, whoa. Mm -hmm emotional abuse is that painful it hurts that bad mm -hmm. that these people actually wish they'd yes. be cheated on like we had been mm -hmm. and as we listened more and more our hearts melted mm -hmm. and we realized that we needed to treat emotional abuse victims the same way we treated the infidelity survivors mm -hmm. and then that went on to treating the um, people who were married to to uh, spouses with uh, life destroying addictions, yes. um, you know, and then financial abuse survivors yes. when, when you had a spouse who was literally taking the rent and grocery money and squandering it. I mean, first Tim Timothy five, eight says, when you have a person who won't even care for their own family, they're to be treated as an infidel. Yes. And so um, 
you know, as, as a young uh, divorce recovery leader, that's slowly how God uh, melted my heart and softened my heart and, and shaped my whole ministry. Because I realized very early on by the early 2000s that emotional abuse survivors needed to be given the same respect we gave uh, everyone else uh, in the infidelity world. And so, um, and then I didn't realize how many Bible verses there were about emotional abuse mm -hmm. and how the Bible actually commands us in multiple places to run from abusers. And it doesn't just say run from abusers unless you're married to them. It says, don't associate with them. Don't even eat with them. And it commands abusive and neglectful and indifferent husbands to divorce their wives in Exodus 21, 10 through 11. And also there's another um, passage that hints uh, to, uh, as to that in Deuteronomy 21, 10 through 14. Mm -hmm. And so you know, if God actually commanded divorce for yes. these indifferent, neglectful yes. uh, uh, husbands who just couldn't be bothered to care for their wives the way they were commanded to, right. um, you know, we've got to take emotional abuse seriously from a, from a theological standpoint. Right. So anyway, uh, yeah. I, 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 <laughs> you Amen. another really good thing. I want to have you come back someday. And I want you to talk about parental alienation because you have experienced that. And a lot of people in my group have had the double insult of not only having the abuser abuse them during the marriage and in court abuse after the, uh, during and after the divorce, but actually turning the children against them. And I really want to hear your story. So anyway. Thank you so Thank much you. for being with me. Thank and you. What a pleasure. It's been a treat. If you benefited from this recording, you will find support and clarity in my book, The Life-Saving Divorce, available in paperback or Kindle on Amazon and in 2022 as an audiobook. You can also follow me, Gretchen Baskerville, on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. You can sign up for my email list at lifesavingdivorce.com. Women and men of faith may request to join my private Facebook group, Life Saving Divorce. For more on Life Saving Divorces, please subscribe and click the link to the next recording.